Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. God has indeed revealed himself to his people. Now, if you've been studying with us, you know that we have been learning about the tabernacle for many, many weeks. And much of what we have learned is repeated. It is stated again, sometimes exactly the same as it was in a previous chapter. Other times, there are slight differences. This is the revelation of God. And we see that there is an emphasis upon a change from how the patriarchs worship, how the children of Israel worship previously, to a new form of worship, a tabernacle worship. And we're going to look this evening in our study at two vessels. As I said, it's not the first time that we've looked at them, but I'm speaking about the menorah, that is that golden lamp stand that had those seven places where light admitted from this lamp stand. And we saw the first time we studied that there is that connection, that inherent relationship between the light being manifested and the reality of God's presence with his people. We need to remember that. God is indeed among us. The fact that one of the ways that Messiah is identified, Emmanuel, means with us God. And as I've said so frequently, that name, Emmanuel, speaks about the redemptive name of Messiah. And we see that that word, Emmanuel, as well as redemption, is connected to worship. So look with me to where we left off last week, to the book of Exodus. Sefer Shemot, the book of Exodus, chapter 37, and we're going to begin in verse 17. And the emphasis tonight will be on that menorah and also on building the altar of incense. And remember, there is a connection. We see this in the book of Revelation. We also see it in the book of Luke, where it speaks about the connection between the incense offering going up and with that offering the prayers of the saints. We read in verse 17, and he made the menorah of, of pure gold. And then we have that same word, the word niksha, which speaks about the, from the word hard, and it's probably referring to beating the menorah into shape. And I realize that I emphasize and emphasize this, but imagine, and the text here is going to make it very clear that there was one lump of gold and everything that had to do with the menorah was, was beat, most likely with a petish, a hammer, from that one lump, one lump into the menorah and its vessels also from it. Very similar to the making of the kaport, that is that mercy seat, or the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, the, the covenant of testimony. So to be able to do it, it's only through the wisdom of God. His equipping of individuals to do His work. So once again, verse 17. And He made the menorah, Pure gold, beating it, he made the menorah. And now we're going to see the various parts. And remember, 
They're not parts that is, are assembled, but there's parts that have been beaten out from that same gold, and it retains that one piece. So it's not pieces are made from it. There's one piece that we're speaking about. And we look, there's the base and also the branch and the cups and the knobs and the flowers. And then we have an expression, mimenu hayu, from it. And this would be from this lump of gold. All of this was. These things were, but here again, they were not assembled. The gold was not cast, melted down and put into a cast. Absolutely not. But Saya, he took a hammer, he had that lump, and he began to beat, that is that word, miksha, everything into the proper shape. Amazingly was this workmanship. Look now to verse 18. Concerning the menorah, we learn something. That it has, look at verse 18, ve shisha kanim. Now here we're speaking about the branches. And we learn that there are six branches. We're going to be told, I'm going to read it in a moment, but I want to prepare us. There is that base, and then there's a, a kind of rod that goes up. And that rod will talk more about, there's a verse that's dedicated to it. And from that rod will be three branches on one side, three branches on the other. Now, there's a debate whether the menorah was like a V, each branch on one side, and then it went to the other, like a V, with that, that miller, middle part dividing them. But notice what the Word of God says, again, verse 18. Six branches went forth from its sides. Three branches of the manure from one side, and three branches of the manure from the second side. So we have that one branch in the middle, the, the base down below, and then we have three. Now, it was probably one, everything's together, but it was to look as one piece that went through that middle. And it was one branch on this side, one branch on that side. And then another one above it, and another one above that. So all together, as we see in verse 18, they shisha kanim, six branches in total that went forth from its sides. Three branches of the manure from one side and three branches of the manure from the second side. Now look at verse 19. We read three cups, and these cups were beat into a form to resemble an almond. So once more, we read three cups. Each branch had three cups. These cups were beat into resemblance of an almond on each branch. So each of these six branches, they had a, a three cups that would look like almonds. They also had, keep reading, they also had a knob, a kaftor, like a button, and also a perach, that is a flower. Three cups that were made to resemble almonds on one branch and also a knob and a flower. Thus, when we go through all of that, we see, we'll read it all together, three cups made to be resembling an almond on one branch, a knob and a flower. Again, he says three cups resembling these almonds on one branch with a knob and a flower. Thus we see, and he says it again, thus altogether there are six branches that go forth from the menorah. Verse 20. Now, verse 20 is going to be speaking not about the six branches, three on one side, three on the other, but rather the middle one. 
And that middle one had a unique construction. Because when we look at verse 20, it says, And in the menorah, four cups. And these four cups of that central branch, that, that middle port part, it says these four cups also were, were made to resemble almonds. And also we see that it had its cups and its flowers. Verse 21. There was a knob, a knob underneath two branches from it. Now, what does that mean? Well, it had one branch going to the right, another one to the left. And it says there in the middle, there was, and what's the word? There was one of those knobs. So each of these, there would be three. And where they come together, there was a knob. Look at verse 21. A knob under two branches from it. A knob under two branches from it, meaning made of it. A knob under two, two branches from it. All together. Tells us again. Six branches went forth. Obviously three on each side. Six branches went forth from it. Verse 22. In verse 22, we're going to focus in on those knobs, and we find that there was as well these their branches from it. They were all of it beaten from one, and the implication is one lump of pure gold. So again, this is the third time that there's a clear reference that all of this was made from one lump of gold. And then in verse 23, we have something that we would say in Hebrew, Yotze Dauphin. Something that's unusual, something that is the exception. Because from this same lump of gold, there were vessels made, and these were separate. He made also, notice what it says, Neroteha. This would be, and this was part of the menorah, attached, not attached, but, but built from it. This would be where the oil was. And we call them candles in modern Hebrew, but they were the places where the oil was and the wick. So there was seven of these places because there were seven altogether branches. That middle one and then three on each side, three times two is six plus one, seven. So we look and he made the, the places for the light, seven. And this is what's unusual. He also made these tongs, and the tongs were probably in order to deal with the wick for the menorah, for, from the oil that was placed in. And also the censers. This would be to, to snuff out the, the fire. And these things were also a pure gold. Look at verse 24. A key card. Now this is like a measurement of gold. It is a lump. You have the word, for example, gush, which is one word for a lump. This is another word. Key card. Zahav, tahor. A pure lump of gold. He made it. What's it? The menorah and all of its vessels. So this tells us very clearly that all the menorah was made from one lump. Now, obviously, those, those tongs were detached and also those, those uh, sensors that were used for putting out the fire. Now, I want to again say something. We, we talked about this the first time, but it's worth repeating. And that is, according to tradition, when one would see the light of menorah. Now, the menorah was not a, a massive vessel. It wasn't very high at all. About the, the length of an average man, the height. And what we see is that there was a miracle according to tradition. And that is, no matter where you were in Jerusalem, 
you could see the light of the menorah. And the light of the menorah because the menorah was pure gold. It wasn't made of acacia wood, but it was made of pure gold and only gold. Likewise, the kaport. The kaport, that mercy seat. And what did we learn last week about the kaport, the mercy seat? That the presence of God. Remember, we, we looked at Numbers chapter 7. And verse 89, when Moses went in to dedicate the tabernacle and prepare everything for worship, and that's what we're going to talk about in a few weeks as we come to the end of the book of Exodus. We see here that when Moses went in, he heard the voice of God speaking with him from the mercy seat, the caport between the cherubim. And therefore, because that mercy seat was pure gold and the menorah was pure gold, we see a connection between them. The kaport speaks about the presence of God and the menorah, the light of the menorah, was a reflection. It testified that God was with his people and that God, he was manifested in darkness because he is that eternal light. So there's much comfort from this menorah. It reminds the people that God is with us. Now let's look at the second section that we're going to study tonight having to do with the building of the incense altar. Now remember that is what Zachariah, and I'm speaking about the father of John the Baptist, by lot, he was serving. It was his mishmor, that is, his turn to go up to Jerusalem to serve. Now, remember something, and so many people neglect this. I hear so many, especially among the mishachim, the messianics, and I consider myself part of that movement. But we need to be very careful. And the reason why I say that is this you will hear many people put an emphasis on timing in regard to the conception of John the Baptist, and we know that he was, was conceived uh, uh, six months before Yeshua. And therefore, we have to think about something. If we can know when John was conceived, then we can know when Yeshua was conceived. And there's people, and let me just share with you, that, that individuals teach this, they are teaching what they've heard others say rather than researching it. And why can I be so sure about this? Very simply, because when we look at the book of Ezra, there is nothing that tells us concerning the timing of these rotation of priests after the destruction of the first temple. Ezra says there was not 24 rotations anymore, but they served in a different way. And by the way, we actually don't know even during the first temple how the priests served. If no information biblically, there was the, for example, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, was from the eighth order, that eighth rotation. But when did it begin? How long did they serve? One week or two weeks? See, the Talmud speaks about two weeks consecutively. One week in Jericho and one week in Jerusalem. Why were they in Jericho? Preparing the food for themselves. Because priests were very, very uh, uh, stringent in the food that they ate. So there is much contradictive information about the priesthood, how they served. We don't know. And therefore, those who say, oh, because Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, went in and he was from the eighth rotation, being from Abihu. Therefore, we know when Messiah was born. No, that does not give us any information. What gives us information is the book of Luke, chapter 1, 
where it says in verse, if I'm not mistaken, in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. If you look there, we can just take a few minutes to do that. Luke chapter 1, and I believe verse 26, where it says here, let's be very specific. In the sixth month, the, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in the Galilee whose name was Nazareth or Nazareth. Now, it's the sixth month. We know when that is, Elul. And there's no reason to think that Yeshua was conceived months later, years later. We know that's not the case. He was conceived in the sixth month. Now, many people say, oh, that's not the sixth month of, of the calendar. That is the sixth month of Elisheva Elizabeth, who was the mother of John the Baptist. Well, that's true as well, because the angel, Zechari the angel appeared to Zacharias in the first month. That's what we're told earlier on in the book of Luke. So those who teach that Yeshua was, was born during Sukkot, there is no biblical evidence to support that. On the contrary, there's biblical evidence that says this is not the case. And it all has to do with something that's so marvelous that as Zachariah, the father of John the Baptist, was serving in the temple, in that holy place, not the most holy place, not the holy of holies, but the holy place. And he was dealing with the incense altar, lifting up, burning, and the smoke would go up. This is accompanying this with the prayers of the saints. And it was at that time that God saw fit in his providence in order to reveal the forerunner of Messiah. Yochanan Ha Matbil John the Baptist. Well, let's conclude. Let's go to the second section, beginning with verse 25. And he made the altar of incense. And again, it was made of acacia wood. Now, remember, the menorah was not, neither was the kaport, the mercy seat. But many other things were of the vessels, once more. And he made the altar of incense, acacia wood, and its length was one cubic, and its width was one cubic, and then it tells us, revua, and that means a square, and its height were two cubits. And from it, it says, there was made its horns. So these would be the horns of the incense offering. Verse 26, even though it was acacia wood, we find as often is the case. Look at verse 26. And he covered it with pure gold. On its top, this is the word gag, which is its roof, and we would translate it its top. Also, its, its walls around, and also its horn. So it was all covered with gold. He made for it, and notice what else? A zare. This is a wreath. I talked about the term carnies or like a crown molding. He made a wreath of gold around about. Verse 27. Once more, like so many other vessels, there were, look at verse 27, two rings of gold he made for it. From underneath the the wreath, that, that crown molding, upon the two sides. Upon the two sides, there were, and this is a different word for side. It speaks about where the rings were, and the rings became kind of like houses for the poles, the vadim. In order to, and we all know what these poles are for, let's set oto bahem. That with these poles that you would lift up, you would carry, you could transport it. Verse 29. And he made these poles also of acacia wood, once more covered. He covered them with gold. And then it's interesting because we come to our last verse. 
We've spoken about the menorah, obviously. The light came because of shemen zayat, that is olive oil. And then we have the incense altar. And the various incense, a special one, not a foreign one, the one that God demanded. It was offered up. And then we conclude this 37th chapter with one more aspect of the tabernacle worship. And this has to do with the holy anointing oil. And there's a relationship because the menorah represents the presence of God. The access that was available to the covenant people of God, that their prayers could could connect to God, go before him through the remembrance of the incense offering, the prayers of the saints. And why did he now speak about this anointing oil? Because when we are in God's presence and when we pray properly, remember the, the incense, not just anything, not according to what we think the incense should be, but there was a specific formula. And there was also a formula for the anointing oil. Let's look at this verse and then we'll close. Verse 29. And he made the holy anointing oil. Now it's Shemen Ha Mishcha Kodesh. And the word Kodesh is holy. And remember what word should come into our mind when we speak about holy? The answer is purpose. The purpose of God. And there's an inherent relationship between the purpose of God and his will. So it's only when I am following, pursuing, desiring the purpose of God. Am I going to be moved in the will of God and equipped with the anointing, that holy anointing, in order to accomplish what is pleasing to God? Once more, verse 29. And he made the holy anointing oil and the, notice the relationship, and the spices of the incense. And they were, in a very, very significant word, it's tahor, pure. So the pure spices of the incense. And then it says, ma'asei, it was the work of, not just anyone but the word here is the rokeach. What's rokeach? Well, in modern Hebrew, the word rokeach is a pharmacist. And what it speaks about is someone who is trained and equipped for what? In order to mix things properly. Now, don't you, when you go and you need a medication, don't you expect someone trained, not just anyone, and this has such an important principle because way too often people are casual with things and they think that, well, you know, if I, if I have the right attitude, if I'm behaving in love, if I'm walking in grace, then uh, almost anything is acceptable. That is a lie from hell. No, we need to realize God is very specific. How would you feel? If there was a pharmacist, the one that's that's preparing your medicine, if he just, you know, he just loves everyone with, with such a big heart. He just loves to give people hugs and such. He's a good old guy. And he just takes, you know, whatever's handy, whatever's there, whatever he thinks is right in his own eyes, doesn't read the prescription or anything, just makes what, what he thinks is a good mixture. Would you want that medicine? No. Well, God doesn't want worship that is not prepared properly. So in the same way, these fragrant incense offerings, they had to be pure. And we see the relationship between, and this is the last thing I'll say, we see the relationship between the purity of the incense offering, which represents the prayers of the saints, and the holy anointing that came upon the people through that oil. God's word is dynamic.
God's word is powerful. And we need to put ourselves under the authority of God's word because it's only when we do that are we going to be under the authority of the Holy Spirit, receiving his pure anointing where our prayers are going to be pleasing and acceptable to God. And there's going to be power and authority to accomplish that wonderful will of God. Well, I'll close with that. Until next week, shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Shalom from Israel.